Praise the Lord. We are live. Awesome. Awesome. Well, it's good to see everyone today, even if I'm looking at you through a phone. Um, praise God. But here soon and very soon, we will be meeting together in person and um, with uh, certain restrictions, of course. Um, there's more to come on that on Sunday, okay? So tune in on Sunday. Sunday, we're still doing um, video only, okay? We're, we're, not, we're not meeting together on Sunday, but I want to let you know to tune in on Sunday over the video. Um, that, way, <clears throat> that way we can um, tell you about our plans and, um, you know, uh, give you some details about, you know, what our, uh, what our plan is coming up very, very soon. So for, so anyways, don't want to get too much into that, but, um, by the way, this is Pastor Kyle with Vision Church of Lockhart. I'm the associate English pastor and, um, praise God. We are in lessons from David. And this was written by Andrew Womack. He's the um, president and founder of Andrew Womack Ministries and Karis Bible College located in Woodland Park, Colorado. And uh, my wife and I, we graduated from his Bible college. And so awesome teachers there, awesome environment, awesome atmosphere. So parents, um, you know, if you're looking to um, invest in your kids and, and I'll tell you, Karis Bible College is a great place. Um, so many different ways they can attend. They don't have to be there physically. There's different locations and stuff. And and they've got business school, missions, I mean, media. I mean, they, they you know, they have it all. They, uh, they have government school there. Um, so it's uh, really awesome. Anyways, just thought I'd put that in there. But let's get into this teaching tonight on seeing through the covenant, seeing through the covenant. And we started this teaching last Wednesday. And uh, we're going to continue on here. Um, it's not a very long teaching, but, you know, it might take us a while. Depends how the Holy Spirit leads us. So let's go ahead and pray and we'll jump in. Father God, thank you for your word, Father. Thank you, Lord, for all the examples we have, the multitudes of examples we have, God, um, good and bad, in the Old Testament to follow. We thank you for the life of David, the heart he had for you, God. And we thank you that we can learn from his mistakes as well as his uh, successes. So we just thank you that tonight, God, we, we open up our hearts and um, we want to grow. We want to grow, Father. We want to stay the same. We want to grow by the milk uh, of the word. We want to grow and and um, consume the spiritual meat that you have for us, Father God. So we just thank you that we are growing and our faith is being built and we're going from grace to grace, faith to faith. And we thank you for that, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. So, this is in, um, thank you, Lord, 1 Samuel seventeen twenty six, And David spoke to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that kills this Philistine, and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine, that he should defy the armies of the living God? Praise God. I love how, how David says that, this uncircumcised Philistine. It doesn't matter what this Philistine looks like on the outside, Right? He looks very mean and, and menacing and big and powerful on the outside. But David, David didn't see Goliath according to what was on the outside. David saw Goliath according to what was on the inside. He was uncircumcised. It means that his heart was far from God. It means he didn't have a covenant relationship with God. God was not backing Goliath. And David knew that. And then the Bible talks about in the New Testament about the believer, those who have put their faith in Christ, that our hearts have been circumcised. Amen? We've been justified. We've been set apart by the blood of Jesus Christ. We are a child of God. We have a, a covenant of God. That's what the circumcision of the heart means, praise God. And um, so David knew. David had a physical circumcision that... Uh, that symbolized his covenant with God. But today, as, as believers, we have that spiritual circumcision in our hearts, right? So, David was expressing here an attitude that was exactly opposite the rest of the Israelites. He was saying, this guy is nothing. He's a nobody. He's easy. 
Everyone else was saying, he's so big and powerful. I'm nothing. I'm a nobody. David had an entirely different attitude. Where did it come from? He stated it right here in uh, 1 Samuel 17, 26. He says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? When David used this term, uncircumcised Philistine, he was saying that Goliath didn't have a covenant with God. Circumcision was a sign of the covenant that God had made with the nation of Israel. He was saying, we are superior. We, uh, why are we letting somebody who doesn't even have God on their side intimidate us? David's attitude came from the covenant, the word, and the promises of God. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> and, you know, some of you may ask, man, if I was in that position, I don't know, I don't know how I would have faced Goliath. David, um, he was so confident of who he was, you know, and, and as Christians, man, we, we've got to know who we are. We're children of God. The promises of God are ours. Amen. We're children of love. We're children of faith. Praise the Lord. You know, God tells us all the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. So do you want a different attitude? Do you want to stand apart from all the people who are so fearful today? They're always griping, complaining, and talking about everything that could possibly go wrong. Do you desire to go out and make your life count? If you want to do exploits like David did, you're going to have to have a different attitude. It's all about attitude. Amen? Um, <laughs> some of you might not get this reference, and I'm probably going to totally butcher this. But um, as a Christian, man, you have to have a go-getter attitude. Amen? Uh, you have to have an overcoming attitude. You have to have an adventurous attitude because faith is an adventure. Praise the Lord. Um, you never know what you're going to encounter. And, I, and this reference that, um, that I was talking about is in, uh, in Lord of the Rings. And I don't know if you guys have seen, you know, the, the Lord of the Rings movies, but in, um, in Lord of the Rings, uh, what Hobbit is it? I think it's Bilbo Baggins, the Hobbit. But anyways, if you don't know about Lord of the Rings, that's fine. But <clears throat> essentially, this this Hobbit was called out to go on a quest, and here he is, all you know, dainty, and and he lives in this nice little house. It's all clean, and everything's everything's organized and collected and stuff. And he's he's has no adventure, no no adventurous spirit in him at all, and he's called upon by these uh, dwarves to go on this great adventure and um, to help them, you know, reclaim their homeland, essentially. And um, he goes through some crazy, crazy stuff that he should have never lived through that, you know, I mean, just crazy stuff. And um, anyways, he comes back changed, a different hobbit, <laughs> a different person. And some of you might be laughing right now because I'm making this reference. Some of you might not, not, might not know what I'm talking about, but that's okay. But he comes back a completely different person, full of adventure, uh, full of, 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 of just strength and a, and a strong spirit. And I'll tell you, as Christians, we need that same adventurous spirit. And, you know, maybe life has bogged you down. Maybe life has kept you down. Something's happened to you that you've lost that vigor. You know, you, you've lost that fight. And I just want to tell you, God, the Holy Spirit wants to restore the fight in you. I know it's tough out there. This world is a tough world. But let me tell you, the Holy Spirit is tougher. Amen? And, and he wants, if you've been knocked down, he wants to straighten you up, pick you up, and make you to stand firm. Praise God. And you know, in Ephesians chapter 6, it tells us, there, having done all to stand, we stand therefore. Praise the Lord. We stand therefore with the full armor of God, the sword of the Spirit, I'll tell you, God wants to in, uh, reignite and instill that fighting spirit within you. Praise the Lord. So you're going to have to look at God's word and evaluate your enemy circumstances and problems based on what the word says about them. David's confidence came from the fact that he had a covenant with God. He was dominated by what the Lord had to say, not by the physical presence of this giant or by what the army of Israel was saying. Only the word, not other people, moved him. Amen. That's powerful right there. So even though I've seen this and lived it, Andrew says here, to a great degree, living in the physical world is like gravity. 
Um, unbelief, doubt, and negativity pull on us constantly. We need to be so dominated by his word that we don't let other people's opinions and what things look like in the physical realm dominate us. I've done this to agree, but I desire to be stronger than ever before. Praise the Lord. And we've got to guard our heart, you know, just like it says in Proverbs uh, chapter four, I believe it is. We've got to guard our heart above all else. We've got to guard it diligently day and night. Amen. We've got to be careful about what we're allowing um, to whatever goes, whatever goes through our eyes and goes into our ears, whatever comes into our eyes and ears abundantly gets into our heart. Amen. And out of your heart flow the issues of life. That's why it's so important that we live a sanctified, separated life. <clears throat> there are certain movies I won't watch. There are certain TV shows I won't watch. Um, you know, and it's, and it's just the only reason is, is because I'm guarding my heart. I'm guarding my heart. Amen. That doesn't mean, you know, you, you live, you know, um, like a turtle in a shell or anything like that. It doesn't mean you just, you, you don't ever associate with the world or sinners, but it is important to guard your heart. Praise God. Be separate, uh, separated from the world. Live a sanctified life. Praise the Lord. All right, let's go on here. That's what made David different. He wasn't the strongest, the biggest, the meanest, or the toughest. David saw things differently than other people did. He looked at this man and said, he's powerless. He doesn't have my covenant. Nobody else had thought of the covenant or the promises of God. They were all just evaluating the situation based on Goliath's height, uh, the size of his weapons, and the weight of his armor. They were looking only in the physical realm, but David was looking at the heart. Therefore, his conclusion was, this man is bankrupt. He has nothing. Praise God. And you know, a carnal Christian, you know, and, and, and Romans chapter 8 talks about this, not to be carnally minded, which is death, but to be spiritually minded, which is life and peace. And, you know, a carnal Christian is a, is a Christian who's believed on Jesus. They're born again. Um, they're sanctified. They're going to heaven, praise God. But they're, they don't live their life by faith. You know, you're, you're still living your life based on what you hear and what you see and what you feel. Um, you make decisions based off the, the physical realm. You, you, you live your life based off the physical realm instead of living and walking by faith like the Lord tells us to. And that's why a carnal Christian won't get very far in the plan that God has for them is because God's plan has to be discerned by faith. Amen? You have to have faith to step out into the unknown. Like when, Abr when God called Abraham out, he said, Abram, he said, leave your father, leave your land, you know, leave, leave everything and go to a land that I'm going to show you. Well, that, that took faith because God didn't tell him where to go. Just to a land I will show you. Amen. See, a carnal Christian wants to know, well, where am I going? Well, God's not going to tell you that. Praise the Lord. Um, it's trust. You got to trust God. God loves you. And he's going to make everything work out together for your good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Praise God. So, it doesn't matter how big your problems are. If you evaluated things that way, you'd recognize that you're the one with the promises. You're the one who has an edge on any enemy that you could face, whether that be financial problems or, or physical issues. Uh, really, the bigger problem confronting you, the greater the opportunity there is to do an exploit for God, to see him come through and to have a better testimony. Praise the Lord. So you'll be so blessed just knowing that you're going to get to see how God will deliver you from this totally impossible situation. Praise God. And that's why, you know, <laughs> Satan, a lot of times when he attacks us, he, he likes to try to work on our minds and our, and our thoughts. That's, that's the way that Satan attacks you is through your mind. That's why you've got to control your thoughts. You know, the Bible says that, um, our, 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 battle is not of this world, right? That our, our warfare is, is a spiritual one. And, um, it says that we have, we have great weapons, um, to pull down strongholds. Amen. And so Satan likes to establish strongholds in the mind where he tries to get you to think upon all these thoughts and, and build this, you know, house in your mind of all these bad or negative thoughts. And, um, Man, we've got to we've got to combat that. Praise the Lord. But Satan likes to attack us through our thoughts, and we've got to we've got to combat these thoughts. And um, 
in, in order to see the way that God wants us to see. Praise the Lord. So we never would have heard of David had he killed a dwarf. <laughs> Instead of praising him and talking about what a great battle this was, people would have criticized him and declared, this was unfair. The headlines in the morning paper would have read, David kills dwarf, sent to prison for life, right? Uh, people would have criticized him had Goliath been a dwarf, but the fact remains that he was a giant. And this means that David had a tremendous opportunity for the Lord to come through with an awesome victory. Praise God. So again, um, Satan's going to try to bring these thoughts against you to bring you down because he, he wants to try to bring you down on the inside to make you feel small on the inside. But God encourages us. He says, look, don't worry. Don't worry. And a lot of times when Satan comes at us, he tries to um, bring these thoughts to us that God doesn't care. You know, God doesn't care. And that's why it tells the, the Lord tells us in Matthew, he says, don't worry. He says, if I care about and, and take care of the birds of the air, how much more will I take care of you? Aren't you of more value to me than a bird? Amen. He says, if I clothe the lilies in the field, won't I much more clothe you? So essentially God is saying, worry stems from the idea that God doesn't care about you. And so people who worry, you're worried because you think that God doesn't care about you, so you have to care about yourself. And you just think yourself into a worry, and it causes physical problems, it causes stress on the marriage, it causes a bunch of different stuff. That's how Satan works in your mind with these thoughts. God cares about you. He cares about your financial problems. He cares about your well-being, your health. He cares about your marriage. He cares about your relationship with your kids, with your parents. Amen. God cares about you. God cares about you. He cares about you when you're lost. He cares about you when you're lonely, when you're sad, when you feel alone, when you feel defeated. God cares about you. He is a God of compassion. He feels what we feel. Amen? And that is exactly why it's so easy for God to relate to us and to, and to shower his love on us is because he does feel what we feel. Even if no one else understands what you're going through, God does. The Bible says in Hebrews, I believe it's chapter 4, that Jesus Christ was tempted in all ways. And yet he, he did not sin. And so he's able to sympathize with us in our weaknesses. Whatever weakness you have, God understands and he knows how you feel. That's why Jesus is the high priest. He, he's the one who mediates to the Father on our behalf. Because Jesus lived in this earth. He's been through the fire. He knows what it's like to be in this, you know, feels like it's God forsaken earth at times. And so Jesus knows what it's like. Amen. He knows how to um, pray to the Father on your behalf, how to mediate on your behalf to the Father that, you know, how we're feeling. And so that's what God wants us to know is that he's with us and he understands. Amen. So <clears throat> um, likewise, instead of seeing how big our problems are, we should think of how great a testimony it will be when the Lord gives us victory over them. Praise the Lord. So all we, the huge key to victory is knowing that God cares about your battle. God cares. Whatever battle you're going through right now, God cares about it. Amen? And he's with you in it. And he wants to see you come out of that thing victorious just like David did. He wants to see you, you know, cut the head off the giant just like David did. Praise God. He wants to see you... Um, you know, cut cut off your debt. He wants to see you uh, cut off your, your financial problems. He, want, he wants to see you cut off the disease and the sickness. He wants to see you cut off the, the giant's head, just like David did with Goliath. That's God's will for you. Praise the Lord. He's not trying to teach you nothing. Uh, you know, he's not trying to teach you anything in this moment about, well, you know, he's trying to teach me humility. He's trying to teach me that. No, the Bible says that if we being evil know how to give good gifts to our kids, how much more will the father give good things to those who ask him? Amen. The Bible says in James, it says that all good things and perfect gifts come from the father above, from, from the father of lights above, praise the Lord, with whom there is no variation. There's no shadow of turning. 
In other words, God is saying, this is who I am. I love you. I care about you. I want the best for you. Okay, let's continue going on here. Um, Even though it's a terrible thing and I wouldn't wish it on anyone, I've seen my son raised from the dead. I felt the same emotions as anyone else, but within a very short period of time, I spoke my faith. Then I started thinking, this is wonderful. What an opportunity this will be. I believe the Lord is going to raise him from the dead. My son had been dead for approximately five hours, had already turned black, and had already been toe-tagged in the hospital cooler. Yet God raised him from the dead. And this is Andrew Womack's son, okay? So during the hours driving the town before I knew what the outcome would be, I was excited, uh, rejoicing, and praying. You might think, come on, Andrew, that's impossible. You couldn't, uh, you couldn't have been. But that's my testimony. I was there. I remember that's how it was, he says. David was the same way. He was not intimidated. He knew he had a covenant with God. And due to this, David had a completely different attitude than most people. He thought, what a great opportunity. I've been anointed king. This is what the Lord has called me to do, defend his people. So by his grace, I'm going to stand up and do it. Amen. Praise the Lord. When you're following the will of God, you know, David was anointed to be king. And how many of you know that you are anointed? If you believed in Christ, you are anointed by the Holy Spirit. You're anointed to lay hands on the sick and see them recover. You are. Not, not just for the pastor. Amen. I don't have some special anointing that, that you don't have. I have the, you have the same Holy Spirit that I have. Praise God. You're anointed to see change in your life. And I'll tell you, there's going to be a Goliath that will rise up and will challenge you. Amen. And instead of relying on yourself and looking to yourself and, oh my gosh, you know, get your head in a spin and running around like crazy. Like, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? But there's this huge giant in my, in my living room, you know? No, you've got to rely on the anointing of God because the, it's only the anointing. See, you're no match for the devil. You're, you're no match at all. You can try to be as strong as you want. You can try to be as moral as you want. You are no match for the enemy. Satan would run in circles around you. So you need to rely on the Holy Spirit. You need to rely on the anointing of God on the inside of you. Amen? And that's exactly how David <clears throat> overcame. Because the anointing reminds you of who you are. The anointing reminded David of who he was. Praise God. He was a child of God. They had a covenant. And the Holy Spirit, the anointing of God, will remind you that you are a child of God. You have promises. You don't have to just lay down and die. Amen? You don't have to just lay down and give up. Fight the good fight of faith is what the Bible says. Okay, so this is what God used to propel Daniel, I'm sorry, to propel David into the public eye. Perhaps he could have done it some other way. We don't know. But this was how the Lord promoted David and got the entire nation to love him. After he killed Goliath, the women came out singing and dancing. Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. When you humble yourself, praise the Lord, um, you don't have to brag about yourself or anything. When you humble yourself, God will exalt you. The Bible says God will exalt you in due time. Praise God. So David made the hit list. He was front page news in all the papers. Beating Goliath propelled, propelled David to a place that actually paved the way for him to take over the kingdom of Israel. What an opportunity. However, all these other men were there too. They had the same opportunity. They were Israelites, covenant people. They could have been used, but they weren't looking at the situation with Goliath through the covenant. David saw this opportunity through the covenant in 1 Samuel 17, 26. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? He declared, I have the Lord's promises and this guy doesn't. He's separated from God. I have him licked, no problem. In 1 Samuel 17, 31, it says, And when the words were heard which David spake, they rehearsed them before Saul, and he sent for him. So David had to start speaking forth his faith. If he had just stood there and not spoken his vision, it would not have come to pass. It wasn't enough just to boldly stand there while everyone else was running and hiding behind rocks and caves and such. He had to start speaking his faith. And he spoke those words of faith. Then the Lord promoted him. God took those words and passed them Uh, through the army, all the way up to the king. So you have to speak forth what the Lord has put in your heart. You can't be timid. Amen? Words are powerful. God will use your words to open up doors and stop the devil in his tracks. Praise God. So, you know, faith is of the heart. Let me just say that, okay? You got to understand that faith is of the heart. It's not, you don't conjure up faith, you know, it's, 
there, there's people who may on the outside look like they're doing something in faith, but there could be no faith in the heart. There could be doubt and unbelief in the heart. But faith comes from the heart. And faith is power. Faith is the power of God. Praise the Lord. And a lot of us could use the power of God in our lives in a lot of different ways. Amen? Because there is no match for the power of God. But the power of God comes from our hearts by faith, and it's released through our mouths. Thank you, Jesus. You got to speak what you believe. Don't be silent. Don't be quiet. You know, that's why uh, here at Vision Church of Lockhart, we encourage our people, vote. When it's time to vote, vote. Amen? That's your power. Praise God. The church has been silent for too long. We've got to speak forth our faith. We've got to be outgoing with it. It doesn't matter if we offend people. It doesn't matter if we offend people who are living in the dark. The Bible says that, that people in the dark, they hate the light. Why? Because when we come around, their evil deeds are exposed. See, people want to just live in their darkness and in their sin and in their um, un, you know, unjustness. If that's even a word, unjustness. And they want to feel okay about it. They don't want to be convicted, amen, of their sin. And so when we come around and, you know, our job is not to condemn people. Our job is to save people and saying, look, you know, here we are. We are the light of the world. We shine on them. Their evil deeds are exposed. This is where you're at. But listen, Jesus died for you. Jesus shed his blood for you. Amen. Jesus took stripes on his back for you to be healed. And so God is wanting to use us as the church to shine our light. But how are we going to shine our light if we won't speak forth our faith? If we won't speak what we believe. Amen. We've got to be out there. We've got to be active wherever we are. Praise God. I was taking a, a walk around, you know, around the, the block last night. And, um, you know, I just saw someone sitting outside. And I, I don't always do this. But, you know, I felt compelled to go talk to this person. And so I did. And I started talking to them about the Lord. And, you know, ministering God's, God's love to them. And um, I'll tell you, there's, I don't, and again, I don't always, you know, do that, but I'm just telling you, we need to be the light and we need to be vocal with our faith. Praise God. Don't worry if people reject you or hate you or mistreat you. God loves you. God is for you. And Jesus said, look, if the world hated me, it's going to hate you. Amen. As Christians, we have to get over this inconvenience and insecurity of people not liking us or not loving us. Praise the Lord. God loves you, and that's enough for you. If you're an insecure person and you're worried about other people liking you or loving you, let me tell you, you need to get a hold of the love of God because once you know that God loves you, you're never going to care if someone else loves you. Honestly, if you experienced the amount, the enormous amount of love that God has for you, you wouldn't even care if your spouse loved you. I'm, I'm being totally serious right now. Obviously, we want our spouses to love us. Nobody likes to be hated, you know? Nobody likes to be hated. We want our spouses to love us and stuff. But I'm just telling you, our lives would be much better. We'd have much more peace in our hearts if we knew that God loved us. And the church has been preaching so much condemnation and so much judgment from God that the church has lost the love of God. And the Bible says that they will know that you are Christians by the love that you have for one another. Amen. Jesus said all the prophets and all the law it hangs on this one thing, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the Bible says in, in 1 John, I believe it is, that we love him because he first loved us. I'm telling you that God loves you and he has an amazing plan for you just like he did with David. Amen. And there's going to be giants. There's going to be Goliaths that will rise up in your life. But when you know that God loves you and you know who you are, you can cut off that giant's head. Amen. I'm just telling you, God loves you. And, and whatever is plaguing you right now, God doesn't want you to stay there. Father God, I pray for my brothers and my sisters right now that are watching. I pray, Lord, for anyone who may not even uh, be saved, may not even know you, Father God. I just pray in Jesus' name, they would experience your amazing love for them, God. That you have a calling on their life. That you, that you know them by name. You have not forgotten them. 
Thank you, Jesus. Father, I just thank you for joy and peace and strength rising up right now in your people. In Jesus' name, that they would not be intimidated by the enemy anymore. Whatever giant it is they're facing that is trying to intimidate them or walk them down into a corner, God. I just pray in Jesus' name, the spirit of faith, the spirit of fight, the spirit of righteousness and holiness would rise up in them and they would speak to their giant in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Some of you out there are thinking right now, you know, what can I do? What can I do? You can speak your faith. Praise God. You have the sword of the spirit. Amen. You have the shield of faith. Speak your faith and you'll be able to quench all the fiery darts of the enemy. Praise the Lord. That's what Ephesians 6 says. Well, that's all we have for today. I want to encourage you guys. Um, <clears throat> praise God. Hello, everybody. See a few people on here watching. How y'all doing? <laughs> we'll be meeting together soon. So stay tuned for, again, on Sunday, we'll be announcing our plans um, to reopen. We won't, we, this Sunday, we're still doing just, just um, you know, live video on Facebook. And you can also catch it on YouTube later. Um, but this Sunday, we will be announcing our plans to reopen with um, certain restrictions. Okay. Uh, so <clears throat> anyways, Praise God. God is good. He's on the throne. And no matter what you're going through, just, I'll tell you, sometimes, and I'm just, I'm just being honest with you guys, sometimes life just stinks. You know? I mean, honestly, sometimes life just, it's a real pain in the butt. <laughs> and you just have to look up to God and say, God, I thank you. It's not going to be like this forever. I thank you. There's a new heaven and a new earth that's coming. Amen. Just get your mind on the Lord and he'll keep you in perfect peace. Praise God. He's going to solve all the problems. Sometimes we get into that attitude of trying to solve all our problems. You know, let God solve the problems. Just have faith in him. Amen. He's, he's able. Praise God. So we're going to take up a tithe and offering now. Um, if you want to give, you can go to vclockhart.com and uh, give online there, or you can send in a check or, or you know, mail or, uh, money order or whatnot to P.O. Box 1399, Lockhart, Texas, 78644. Uh, we appreciate all you guys who have been given faithfully. And um, praise God. I don't care if, you know, we're not meeting together. There's not a, there's a pandemic going on. Man, God is still on the throne. Amen. So I don't know about you, but, you know, my wife and I, we've, we're still continuing to honor God with the first fruits of our income, you know, uh, with 10%. And, and, and more than that in different offerings to different, you know, ministries. And um, I know everybody's in a different position, different situation, you know, going on. Some still have jobs, some don't. But I just want to encourage you, you know, honor the Lord. Honor the Lord. And um, so, anyways, let me pray over you as you give. Father God, I just thank you, Lord, for everyone who's giving with a cheerful heart, Father. Lord, I thank you. Um, we honor you, Lord. You know, there's... There's no amount of money that can satisfy you or do anything. Money doesn't do anything for you, God. But it's not about the money. It's about the heart. And we give to you from our hearts, God, because we love you and we honor you. And we are thankful that you are our provider. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right, guys. I love you. Um, praise God. God bless you all. Um, we will see you very, very soon. Uh, stay tuned for Sunday uh, for a big announcement coming. All right, God bless.